So we're going to be thinking about preaching the Bible evangelistically. I'm very conscious, as I was thinking about that, I was very conscious there are two scenarios in which that normally happens, certainly in my experience. Uh, one is in the kind of uh, week by week regular teaching of God's Word in the congregation. And uh, some of what I say will uh, we, we, we'll have that in mind. Uh, but then there are also those uh, kind of special occasions when you get to preach evangelistically, uh, perhaps in guest services or um, uh, in evangelistic meetings, uh, those kind of issues. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm aware of both of those contexts. What I say will apply some more to one, some more to the other, but I've got both of them in mind. Is that clear? And what I want... To What I want to do is, uh, I want to preach a, uh, a, I want to begin by preaching a sermon that I uh, preached in an evangelistic context. Now, we don't have time for me to do that uh, to, in the normal way, so I'm going to do a very compressed version of that. And then I want to uh, give a number of reflections, and I'll keep referring back. It, it really, I want to explain to unpack, to kind of deconstruct the approach I took. Does that make sense? So uh, the, uh, it, this was part of a, a three-part series that we did in our church, looking at different big questions that uh, people ask. And I was given the question, uh, how can you believe in miracles? So that was uh, what I was dealing with. So here's my sermon, okay? Very sort of compressed version. Probably won't get as passionate as I might do normally. But uh, you never know, so let's see how we go. Uh, lots of weird stuff happens in the Bible. People walk on water. One person disappears up into the sky. It stretches credibility. And so a question that I'm often asked is, how can you believe these stories in the Bible? That seems so far-fetched. The first thing I want to say is that our lack of experience does not rule out miracles. Uh, the, one of the favorite philosophers of the uh, new atheists is David Hume. And David Hume says about miracles, nothing is esteemed a miracle if it ever happens in the common course of nature. In other words, we know that miracles don't exist because we have never seen one. To say that we, miracles don't exist because we've never experienced one is a bit like saying British tennis players don't win Grand Slam titles, which a few years ago was something that we had never experienced, not in, not in living memory. But, but that doesn't mean it can't happen, as Andy Murray has recently proved, if you, if you know about your tennis. Just because you've never seen a miracle doesn't mean a miracle can't happen. In fact, uh, Hume himself says that we can't prove that the future must be conformable to the past. We can't prove that the future will be like the past. Also, the laws of nature don't rule out miracles. Again, Hume says, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. And as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, that they, they cannot be violated. Miracles violate the laws of nature, and we know that can't happen. Well, C.S. Lewis uh, gave an illustration to uh, address this. He says, suppose I put two pounds in a drawer... Uh, one day, and then a week later I put two more pounds in, and then a week later I put two more pounds in, and then when I open the drawer, I find that there's only one pound in there. What's happened? Have the laws of arithmetic been broken, or the laws of England? And his point is twofold. The, the point is that the laws of nature are not like the laws of England. The laws of nature are not statutes that we must observe. They are patterns that we've, we've observed in the world. Scientists are not the kind of police who go around enforcing the laws of nature. And then secondly, Lewis says, what's, what's actually happened in this scenario? Well, clearly there's been an intervention. Someone has come and stolen five of his pounds. Someone has intervened. Has the thief broken the laws of arithmetic? No, he's kind of intervened and, and altered the situation. And that's what happens. If there is a God, he intervenes from outside our universe, and he's not violating the laws of nature. He's simply changing the context in which they operate. If there's a creator, then there's no law that says he can't intervene in his world to perform miracles. 
So there's no reason that miracles can't exist, but that doesn't mean that they do. And indeed, we're right to be sceptical. I'm sceptical about many miracles that I hear about. So then we need to address the question, do miracles happen? And I want to focus on the resurrection of Jesus because that's the key miracle, key to the very claims of Christianity. Now here I'll uh, go a little bit quicker because I'm sure this will be kind of familiar kind of territory to many of you. But I began with a quote from Hume again. Uh, actually, we read the account in John's Gospel of the resurrection of Jesus. And then I uh, went back to Hume. And I, Hume says, When anyone tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it be more probable that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or that the fact that he relates should really have happened. In other words, Hume says there are three options. John is deceiving, and the resurrection is a hoax. But if that is the case, here are people who died for those. You don't die for a hoax that you're perpetrating. And anyway, it could have been quickly disproved. Or, says Hume, John is deceived, and the resurrection is a mistake. And behind that is the assumption that these were gullible, superstitious people who were kind of ready to believe anything. But again, the Bible, the story doesn't portray that. Here is Thomas. He's skeptical. He wants proof. There's a kind of chronological snobbery behind that. It assumes that we are clever and sophisticated, and they were a bit stupid back then. And then thirdly, the third option is that John is right, and the resurrection story really happened. And again, I quote from Hume, but essentially he's saying that, which is the more likely? the more likely option is that actually this is what really happened. Now, I realize these arguments are not decisive. There's not a kind of QED here where you can logically demonstrate something. But I want to suggest it's worth exploring. It's worth exploring the evidence for yourself. Scientists line up on either side of this discussion. This is not a debate between science and religion. It's a debate between atheism and theism. And here's where I agree with Hume. Hume also says this, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. In other words, reason is driven by, by our passions, by our desires. Here's a quote from Richard Lowenton, the professor of genetics at Harvard University, and it's very revealing. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense, scientific claims that are against common sense, is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science, uh, Lowenton, by the way, is an atheist, just in case you haven't picked that up by, yet, by now. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism, that, that this world that, that is all that there is. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the world, but on the contrary, we are forced by an a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation, a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now, did you follow what he's saying? He's saying we don't, we don't start with the sort of scientific method and then discover that this material world is all this is. We start with that commitment to a material world, just a material world, and, and create a set of constructs that then prove that, demonstrate that, because we can't allow a divine foot in the door. In other words, we reject miracles. The reason Lowenton rejects miracles is because he doesn't want God. It's an admission of prejudice. Now, I don't say that to be rude or dismissive, because I think we all have prejudices. I have a prejudice. I'm inclined to believe the miracles in the Bible because I do want God. If you know God and love God, then you won't have a problem believing miracles. If you hate the idea of God, then you'll readily find reasons to reject his existence, which, of course, by the way, was what uh, Peter Williams was saying last night on, on the issue of the Bible. 
I can't definitely prove to you that miracles in the Bible happened. In fact, even if someone performed a miracle in front of you, I suspect that wouldn't be enough to convince you. People, there were people who saw the miracles of Jesus who then plotted to kill him. If you're determined to re reject God, then you'll find reasons to reject his miracles. But I want you to recognize that believing in miracles is rational if God exists. You may still reject God, but you'll be doing so for other reasons. So let me ask a final question. Why do miracles happen? You may say, miracles don't happen in my experience. They don't happen in my world. I want to suggest that that actually is the point. Miracles are not normal. Miracles point to who Jesus is. He's the savior of the world. I, ca I can't do miracles like Jesus because I'm not the son of God. The miracles of Jesus were signs that he is God's son, sent by God as the savior of the world. And miracles point to what Jesus does. He's creating a new world. Our world is a world of hunger and pain and suffering. Jesus doesn't fit in our world. He bursts our explanation. To judge what he did by our experience of what happens misses the point. The miracles of Jesus don't belong in our world because they're a glimpse of another world. Our world, the world we create, is a world of famine and injustice and division and hurt. But the kingdom of Jesus is very, very different. For a moment in history, we were given a glimpse of that coming reality. The poor are fed, the sick are healed, the dead are raised. This is God's future. And it can be your future if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus. So I want to invite you to explore knowing Jesus for yourself. You can just form a little orderly queue. We can... Uh... <laughs> So there you are, that's what, I, that's what it was. I, I guess it was about half an hour, so it's a little bit more filled out from there. But let me comment on that as we go along. Uh, and um, I want to go back to that quote from Richard Lowenton. And that idea that uh, the scientists, the, as a scientist, I mean, I, I did in the talk, I made the point that you know, there are plenty of scientists that line up on either side of this debate but that he was driven not by his scientific method, but by his prior commitments. I was watching um, a film-length documentary on the television recently about the search for the Higgs boson particle. And kind of halfway through, there was an extraordinary moment when one of the world's leading cosmolo co cosmologists acknowledged that the chances of the cosmos being anything other than chaotic are so remote that it is as if, this is what he said, as if there is a benign hand on the dial finely tuning our universe. It is as if there is a, fine, a hand on the dial. But rather than accepting a benign hand, he concluded that there must be multiple universes, most of which are chaotic, and we just got lucky living in one of the very, you know, very few that, that kind of works. Do you understand his point? Now, I want you to notice two things about that argument. First, what, what drives that thinking is not what can be observed. It's not the scientific process. But a prior commitment to ruling out a benign hand on the dial. Actually, his observations of the universe lead to the conclusion that there's a benign hand on the dial, a god. But he's got a prior commitment to there not being a god. And secondly, for that worldview to work, this is what I found most extraordinary about it, there must be a reality outside of this universe. He, he can only make sense of the world by, by positing a reality outside this universe. In his case, thousands and thousands of other universes. So here he is, here is a materialist who, who can only make sense of the world with explanations that come from outside of the universe. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is, this is the world of cosmology. The, the cosmologists, for their, for their theories to work, and I'm, I'm not at all dismissive of this, by the way. I think this is you know, it's extraordinary what, what is being discovered and, and researched and so on. 
But for their theories to make surf, they have to, they, they have a th this is, they have to posit dark matter, uh, which is something that we cannot see or observe or experience. We have no evidence for it. And yet, uh, if, their, if their sums are right, it makes up five-sixths of the mass of the universe. They can only make sense of the world by positing something that is beyond what we can observe and experience, which is actually no different to a Christian worldview, in the sense that we make sense of this universe by, by reference to something outside of this universe. Now, let me quote from Audelus Huxley, uh, uh, one of uh, famous British scientists from the uh, last century. It's a long quote, but it's, I, it's worth quoting in full. Uh, just uh, listen carefully and follow this with me. I had motives for not wanting the world to have a meaning and consequently assumed that it had none and was able, without any difficulty, to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with a problem in pure metaphysics, you know, how the world is. He is also concerned to prove that there is no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to do. For myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaningless was essentially an instrument of liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. We objected to the political and economic system because it was unjust. The supporters of these systems claimed that in some way they embodied the meaning, a Christian meaning, they insisted, of the world. There was one admirably simple method of confuting these people and at the same time justifying ourselves in our political and erotic revolt. We could deny that the world had any meaning whatsoever. That's striking, isn't it? So what is driving his, his, uh, his, his kind of atheistic understanding of the world as, as a purely material world is his desire for sexual freedom. The movement is not from metaphysics to morality, from atheism to human autonomy, it's not as if we reluctantly concluded that there is no God and then began to try and work out how we could live without him. No, the movement is from morality to metaphysics. We want to be free from God's rule, and so we kind of create a worldview in which God is absent. Let me give you one more quote, and then uh, I'll try and move on to what this means for preaching. See if you can guess who, who made this, who said this, okay? Okay. I'll give you a clue. It's the kind of the last person you expect. It has gradually become clear to me that what every great philosophy has so far been, it has been a confession on the part of its author, a kind of involuntary and unconscious memoir. So every philosophy is really a confession. Moreover, the moral or immoral intentions in every philosophy have every time constituted the real germ of life out of which the entire plant has grown. To explain how a philosopher's most remote metaphysical assertions have actually been arrived at, it is always wise to ask oneself first, what morality does this aim at? I accordingly do not believe a drive to knowledge to be the father of philosophy, but that another drive, here as elsewhere, has employed knowledge, or false knowledge, as a tool. Again, what he's saying is, every philosophy is a confession of, of the morality, or the immorality, of the person advocating it. Now, can you guess who said that? Nietzsche, very good. It's Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, who, who more than anyone typifies the kind of Modern atheism, the revolt against God. You know, he's the guy who said, God is dead and we have killed him. But I, in this respect, I think he's right, completely right, absolutely brutally honest. And what is driving that atheism is actually morality or the lack of morality. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise to readers of the Bible. Romans 1 says, What may be known about God is plain. But then it says, it also says, people suppress the truth by their wickedness. 
Or the Bible again says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But that person, that fool, is not intellectually deficient. As you'll know, the fool in the Bible is someone who refuses to live God's way. In fact, the psalmist goes on, the problem is they are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. That is what is driving this, this declaration that there is no God. In other words, it's not that people cannot believe, but that they will not believe. We will not believe in God because we don't want to live with God. And so Romans 1 continues, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. As a result, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. In other words, our thinking becomes twisted because we're finding reasons to justify the life we want to live. It's not that people cannot believe in God, it's that they will not because they don't want to live with the consequences of belief in God, of accountability to him, of dependence on him. It's an issue of the heart as much as an issue of the head. Well, let's think about what the implications are for preaching to unbelievers. The first thing I want to say is we need to preach to the heart. This is at the sort of heart of what I'm saying. It means our job is not simply to convince them that the truth is true. We also need to convince them that the truth is good. Does that make sense? Not just that the truth is true. That's important, by the way. I don't want to ditch truth. And uh, the fact that the Bible is true, again, as Peter Williams was reminding us yesterday, it matters that the events described in the Bible actually happened. So we do need to persuade them that the truth is true, but we also need to persuade them that the truth is good. And in fact, I don't think people will begin to really engage with whether the truth is true until they've started to get a glimpse of the fact that the truth might be good, that this might be worth exploring, that this might be worth having an open mind on. We need to make people wish it were true before they will really engage with whether it is true. Now, I should say, by the way, one of the things, I do want to make this, it, I think we, we, can often pre, we can often think about preaching or preach as if there is this, um, as if someone's in, 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 um, encounter with Christianity is going to happen all within a sort of 30-minute sermon, you know, and that's going to take them from nothing to conversion at the end. In the reality, most people, I'm sure this is your experience, are saved, become Christians after sort of multiple contacts with Christianity, some of which are talks, some of which might be something they've read, some of, most of it will be conversations, a little bit of conversation here, seeing Christian community, all of these things are part of the package. So I, I don't think we need to worry too much about sequencing it all up as if there's some kind of process that people go through, because people are going to be, have multiple kind of encounters with Christianity. Uh, in most cases. But I think somewhere along the line, and, and, and we need to persuade people that the truth is good, that this is worth exploring. And that's what I'm trying to do in my preaching. So in the, in the talk I gave, uh, what I, the, the way I did that was actually more, much more at the end of the talk, when I asked the question, why do miracles happen? And I'm beginning to engage with a little bit of the scepticism, because I think I'm asking these things don't normally happen in our world. That's the point. They have because they're pointers to a new world. But and I sort of elaborated this a little bit more in the actual talk. I want to give people a picture of that new world that is glimpsed in the ministry of Jesus in a way that's attractive and compelling and contrasts with the world that we have created. I want to offer them a vision of a better future if they embrace Christ. Uh, as way, and my aim there is to make them wish it were true so they can begin to engage with whether it is true. I want to give them a glimpse of glory. And so that means that in our preaching, whether it's a sort of special one-off for, um, for unbelievers or whether it's the everyday or week-by-week -week preaching to the gathered congregation, which hopefully unbelievers are present in and, and looking in on, uh, I want to portray the grace and glory of God in a compelling and attractive way. Because it is compelling and attractive. 
So when I preach, I'm always asking myself, how is this good news? Every, every sermon, every sermon, that's one of my kind of, probably my key kind of um, check on what I'm doing. How is this good news? How am I showing how attractive Jesus is? And I think that's really important. The God assumed in Western thought is either a solitary, powerful being who demands our obedience. Doesn't sound particularly attractive, does it? Or a kind of cosy Father Christmas or Sky Fairy whose job is to do nice things for us. Again, not terribly compelling. Those are the gods most people believe in them if they have any notion of God. They're also the gods that most atheists and agnostics have rejected. Rightly, actually. In other words, when people are rejecting God, they're they're normally rejecting a false notion of who God is. This is not the God of the Bible. The true God is a trinity of persons existing eternally in love. The Father so delights in his Son, and the Son so delights in the Father through the Spirit, that the triune God created the whole of creation to share that mutual delight. The Trinity extends its life of love to humanity. The Gospel is not simply that Jesus died in our place so that sins can be forgiven. It is that, but it's more than that. If you just stop at that sort of message of sins forgiven, you're kind of portraying God as this judge. And of course, he is a judge, but that's only half the story. Who wants to love a judge? Who is drawn to a relationship with a judge? The gospel is that the Father sent the Son so that we can be adopted as his children. He sent the Spirit of his Son so that we can know ourselves to be adopted as his children. That's the invitation of the gospel, an invitation to share the Trinity's life of love. Now, as I say, preaching to the heart doesn't mean we neglect the head. Uh, it, partly because the only route that we have to people's hearts is through their heads. You know, we, we, we speak words that must be understood, and we, 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 preach a, we preach the Bible that must be explained clearly. And also because, it's, as I said earlier, that uh, we, we want to demonstrate that the truth is good, so that we create the opportunity to show that the truth is true. And so, in the, again, going back to that little sermon that I preached, uh, what I was trying to do at the beginning was to, uh, in a sec, deconstruct the objections to create a space in which I can appeal to the heart. So I, I'm conscious that people are coming with certain prejudices about Christianity. I'm trying to remove some of those so that we can get to the real issue. For me, the key point in that sermon was, where is it? It's where I say, um, we're, we're all biased. If you know God and love God, you'll have no problem believing in miracles. If you hate the idea of God, then you'll readily have reasons for his existence. I want to I wanna deconstruct some of the objections so that we can, as it were, together agree that that's true. And then I want to give them a compelling reason for exploring belief in God. Preach of the heart, preach Jesus. I think, going back to the apologetic issue, I think a perpetual temptation for preachers is to provide philosophical answers to intellectual questions. But we're called to preach Christ and him crucified. So by all means, take people's questions seriously, address their intellectual concerns. That's what I was doing in the kind of first half of my talk. Your hearers need to know that you are captivated, uh, but, 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 but above all, preach Jesus. Ensure that delighting in Jesus is central. Your hearers need to know that you're captivated by, not, not by some fascinating philosophy, uh, but by him, by a person. And so one of the things, one again, one of the, particularly with apologetic questions, is I want to bring it back to who Jesus is and what he did. So that's why I went for the resurrection. And, but, but not just the resurrection, but what he came to do what his miracles were actually trying to accomplish, that they were signs of a coming world that he was going to create, he was going to restore through his death and resurrection. So it's really helpful just to think about, 
is there something that Jesus said or something that Jesus did that I can use as the focus for my response if I'm addressing one of those kinds of questions? Uh, we don't counter the wisdom of the world with our own wisdom. It is Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Then another thing is preach, I've called it preach in the real world. And by, that's what I mean by this. I don't think that we have to make the Bible contemporary because it is contemporary. Uh, it's very striking in the, Hebrew, in the book of Hebrews. It's worth doing this. Just look at how, the, when Hebrews quotes from the Old Testament, how those quotes are introduced. Sometimes it says, it was said, and sometimes it is, it says. Or in fact, it's not it, it's it's a person. In fact, the father, sometimes the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, all three are used in, in Hebrews. So it will say the Holy Spirit says, present tense. And in other words, God is, it's not, a, it's not just, I should, oh, I got that wrong. It's not just that God has spoken in the past, but God speaks through the Word. So we don't have to make the Bible contemporary, but I think we do have to show its connection with the contemporary world. People need to feel that this is a contemporary word for them, so that it sounds contemporary. I want, I want, as I preach, I want to make the word of God sound contemporary as I make those connections to, uh, to real life. And I want, uh, I want to try and hear my sermons as a newcomer would hear them. So, I, as I said earlier, I don't assume people know their Bibles well. I don't use jargon. I avoid uh, uh, sort of those technical terms. I try and tis- anticipate uh, how people will respond to the word. So, I acknowledge cultural distance. So, in, in, in the example I just gave, I, I began by saying some weird things happen in the Bible. I often do that. I often acknowledge to people. I'm conscious that if you're there for the first time, and I, in fact, I had a great example of this. I was doing um, evangelistic Bible study with uh, a, a, a young woman, my wife and I, and we were doing the story of the Ascension. And she just looked, I could see her look. She was saying, seriously, you mm-hmm. think a man floated up into heaven and disappeared? Up, you know, disappeared in the sky somewhere. And I was kind of about to leap in all defensive. And then I thought, no, that is pretty weird, isn't it? I mean, that is, can you imagine how that, what happened, you know? And so I think just to acknowledge that actually goes a long way. Because otherwise people are going to sat there and thinking, this guy's a loony. Doesn't he realize that walking on water is bizarre, you know? We, we get so used to it. We take it in our stride. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus walks on water, that story again. But, but for them, it's just... It's, it's mind-blowing. So you've got to acknowledge that. Acknowledge doubt. You may say things like, I know this is hard to believe. Uh, anticipate people's objections. If you're not doing that, then they're going to get fixated on that. And, and you know, you carry on with the sermon. They're left behind thinking, hang on a minute. God just said, wipe out the Canaanites. You know, now you, I, I, I think you don't, or you don't, it's not that you have to sort of go into a big kind of lengthy explanation of why the, God wiped out Canaanites or anything. Sometimes you could, it's just enough to acknowledge it. So that this person says, okay, well, at least this, this person's thought about this. Now I can kind of carry on and track with them as they go through the sermon. Does that make sense? Uh, acknowledge suffering as well. So often when we're preaching, we will touch upon areas in people's lives where they're suffering, and it's important to acknowledge that. You, you, know, you, may, you may have had this experience, or you may, have, you may be in this kind of situation. Uh, so you make that point of connection. It's really important, I think, to make the connections with people. I once heard um, a sermon by a guy called Rico Tice, who you may know from Christianity Explored, if you've come across that material. And, and, and really, what he did was, for 25, he, he had a 25-minute introduction where he didn't refer to the Bible or anything. He just referred, he just talked about life. And I can't remember the details. I wish I'd written it all down now. And then he read the passage. And it was just 
it was an astonishing moment. He just read, I mean, he then talked for another five or ten minutes after that, but he could have stopped after reading the passage. He had set it up so well. It's so kind of connected with our experience that when we heard the passage, it just went wham. Does that make sense? So I'm trying to connect with people's experience. I usually use the introduction for that. In fact, my, my rule of thumb is, for an introduction, is the introduction should raise the question for which the passage or the sermon is the answer. So I write them last, because I, the, I don't know what the answer is at that point, you know, at the, at the beginning. But once I've written my sermon, I then think, what's the, if this is the answer, what's the question? And let's raise that question in a way that the unbeliever says, yes, that is how I think. I don't want to do a sort of Aunt Sally. Do you, have, do you know the expression Aunt Sally? No, probably not. Um, it's a sort of, um, or straw man. There's, no, that's probably not helping either. I don't want to set it up in a way that anyone goes, well, nobody really thinks that. You know, or that's just, you, you've created a caricature that's easy to dismiss. I want, to, I want them to feel, yes, that is what I think, or that is what I feel. So I really want to. Em- I really want strong sense of empathy at that point, as I then because I think that will create an opportunity to then go on and bring God's word to bear on it. Uh, preach with patience. Uh, we've talked a little bit that in the questioning. So uh, you know, just go. Uh, that's where I go back to that idea of a one to ten scale. Most people in our context are. Uh, particularly on initial contact, have such a little background now in terms of the Bible story that I think we have to be patient. And uh, so in, Ken, in the example that of uh, my talk that I gave, it was, uh, there was no great appeal, but, but an invitation to explore more. Um, having said that, I do think we need to preach for a response. So you might not be able to do that in every sermon. So, you know, some talks will be more invitation to explore, but as part of the overall preaching of the church or people's exposure to you and to the gospel, you do need to preach for a response. Um, and that's getting harder, I think, in our culture because it's culturally uh, unacceptable to tell people they're wrong and that they need to change. But that is what it, that's, that's inherent in the gospel appeal. Um, to call people to faith and repentance, a change of their thinking, a change of their behavior, above all, a change of their allegiance. And so we need to call people to faith and repentance. The gospel is not an option for people to consider. Christ has been given all authority under heaven and earth, and he sends us to, to proclaim that authority, to call on people to submit to his kingship. Uh, to call people to obedience. You know, the evangelistic pitch, as it were, of Jesus was a call to die. If anyone would come after me, must take up his cross. Uh, You don't get more radical than that. And the thing is that if you accept that call, then a lot of the other discipleship issues are sorted out. That's something I've really learned from uh, uh, talking with people who are... um, uh, doing mission amongst Muslims in the Middle East. There's a very strong sense that, that, that when, when, when a Muslim chooses to follow Christ, they know that that means the rejection of their family and possibly martyrdom. And if that's the choice you make, then how you spend your money or your time, or you know, those, those are all kind of wrapped up already in that decision. Um, well, our evangelistic pitch is, in the end, it's an appeal to die come and follow Christ to take up your cross. And we don't need to, we should not sell that short. But we do that by proclaiming the surpassing worth of Christ. And that's always what's in my mind. How is this good news? I mean, a call to die is not good news, is it? But a call to, um, to embrace the beauty and glory and riches of Christ, even if that means death. That is good news. I was thinking of um, Philippians 3, where he says, I consider all things lost compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, my Lord. I've lost everything, but that's fine, because I've got Christ. We've got to portray Christ so that losing everything seems like small, small beer compared to grasping Christ.